What it does instead is it goes to your liver. The liver can't metabolize all of it. It metabolizes what it can. And the rest of it has to be diverted. Dr. Robert Lustig, I am thrilled to welcome you to the podcast. Welcome, Doc. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate you my being here. Yeah. And we today are going to be talking about your new book, Metabolical, which is a very clever portmanteau between the words metabolic and diabolical. And we were just talking in the pre-chat about how this is very much an expose of some of the, you know, darker forces that are trying to keep us as a society sick and diseased and how profiteering can really um, uh, really does make the policy decisions of the day. Um, but we, and we're going to talk about that today, but I wanted to start with some science because my audience, uh, we love geeky science and we're going to go on a geeky magic carpet ride, hopefully together, uh, today. And one of the primary tenants and really a through line of the book is this idea that if you protect the liver and you feed the gut, all will be well. And we'll kind of layer that through our conversation as we go through um, some of the different tenants that we were talking about. And I thought we could start with sugar. I think that a lot of people, when they say sugar, they don't realize that there are different kinds of sugar. You know, women will say, oh, I got a touch of sugar. My blood sugar is a little high, but maybe we can, you know, defer to the subject matter expert here, you, and you can maybe talk a little bit about the delinea the difference between, you know, glucose and fructose are the two ones that I'm most interested in. And, um, you know, what are some of the different physiological effects on the body from right. those two? Happy to help. So let, let me start out by saying the food industry doesn't want you to know any of this. And so they've actually created a whole marketing campaign around various uh, concepts that are completely untrue. The most important ones are a calorie is a calorie, which is completely untrue. And also a sugar is a sugar, which is also completely untrue. It sounds good on the back of a, you know, breakfast cereal box, but it actually is, you know, complete, completely fallacious. And it's so completely fallacious that uh, lawyers are now starting to sue food companies and starting to win for deceptive advertising. So you know that something's up. So let's start with this word sugar. You know, it means two things. There's blood sugar, like what diabetics check, which is a blood glucose. And glucose is the energy of life. Every cell on the planet burns glucose for energy. Glucose is so important that if you don't consume it, your body makes it. So if you never consumed a molecule of glucose in your life, it wouldn't matter. The Inuit, you know, they didn't have any place to grow a carbohydrate. They had ice, they had whale blubber, okay. They still had a serum glucose level. And the reason is because it's so important, your body has a method for being able to turn other macronutrients, fats or proteins into glucose. So glucose is essential. It's just not essential to eat, if you will. And then there is this other molecule called fructose. Now fructose is completely vestigial. There is no biochemical reaction in any eukaryotic organism, that is any animal cell on the planet that needs it. It is absolutely unrelated to life. It is a storage form of energy for plants. We, when we evolved off of plants way back in our evolutionary uh, uh, tree, Okay, we basically stopped needing it, and that's good. Otherwise, we'd all just be a stick of corn instead of being, you know, who we are today. It allow us to grow our brains. Um, the bottom line is, fructose is completely unnecessary for life. So, if you never had another molecule of fructose in your diet, not only would you survive, but you'd actually be better. 
And the reason is because fructose is vestigial because it's not necessary. It is an energy source. It can be converted into ATP, the chemical form of energy that our cells use to power itself. That's true, but it's not necessary. It's completely vestigial, just like alcohol. Alcohol is not necessary either. If you never consumed a molecule of alcohol in your life, you would be better too, and you would live longer. You might not have as much fun, but the bottom line is you don't need alcohol for, for life. Yet it's calories, it's energy, it can be converted into ATP also. Just because something can be converted into ATP doesn't make it good for you. Trans fats can be converted into ATP, and we know they're the devil incarnate. So just because something is calories doesn't mean it's okay. Therefore, a calorie is a calorie is complete and utter BS. But that is the food industry's method for basically getting you to eat whatever they want you to eat. And that's how they've been so successful for the last 50 years is on this basis of a calorie is a calorie. So that is the first thing that has to be debunked. And it's debunked with science but it is absolutely politically uh, motivated to understand that. Okay, now let's get into this glucose fructose and what fructose does. So glucose, yeah, it raises your serum glucose. And yes, that raises your insulin response. And insulin is the bad guy in this story. Insulin makes fat. Insulin is the hormone that takes whatever's in your blood that you're not using to burn and diverts it into fat cells for storage. That's insulin's job. So if you're not storing, you don't need enough, very much insulin. But when you consume any glucose, your glucose level in your blood will rise. That's what diabetics check with their blood sugar. That's the blood glucose with their little, you know, with the, with the uh, 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 medicines or the mini med or, you know, the AccuCheck or whatever or the continuous glucose monitor now, either one, any of them, they're checking the serum glucose, the blood glucose. They're not checking the blood fructose. And the fructose that you consume raises the fructose levels in your blood, but you don't measure that. The only way to measure that is in a research lab. So you don't know what you're actually doing. So when something says it's low in glycemic index, that means that the blood glucose doesn't rise very high. Therefore, the insulin response doesn't rise very high. Therefore, hopefully less of what you ate will end up in fat cells. That's the idea behind glycemic index. But the back door there is that if it's filled with fructose, that's not going to affect your blood glucose anyway. Well, and that's the problem. And that's right. also a lie. Mm -hmm. So people say low GI, you know, they actually sell bought bags of sugar down in Australia that say low GI cane, which is like the biggest joke on the planet. So it sounds good. Oh yeah, let's keep the insulin down. Except that what fructose does is it doesn't raise your serum glucose. Of course it doesn't, it's fructose. What it does instead is it goes to your liver. The liver can't metabolize all of it. It metabolizes what it can, and the rest of it has to be diverted. And what happens is it gets turned into fat, fat in the liver. And then that fat in the liver can, has one of two fates. It can either be exported out as triglyceride and then cause heart disease or obesity, or it can precipitate in the liver. And now you've got fatty liver disease, and that will precipitate diabetes, and Alzheimer's and many other chronic diseases. So that fat in the liver and how you make that fat in the liver has everything to do with the, with the specific of, specifics of what you eat. Not the calories, but the actual molecules themselves. Fructose being the biggest driver of fat, and also branched chain amino acids, leucine, isoleucine, valine, what you find in protein powder in the health food store that bodybuilders use to pump iron. And if you're building muscle, then you need them. But if you're not building muscle, excuse me, then you don't need them. Um, 
those all get turned into fat in the liver. I apologize. Um, I'm trying to turn this off and I can't turn it off. I'm trying to stop the ring. Ah, there it is. So where were we? And I'll try to re- uh, sure. You were talking about um, fructose is, you know, we have de novo lipogenesis. Uh, so it either goes to the adipocyte oh, right, right. or right. it's ectopic fat in right. the liver. Right. So the, it, 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 uh, the fructose can either be packaged as triglyceride, be exported out of the liver and then lead to cardiovascular disease and or obesity or it can precipitate in the liver as a lipid droplet. Now you've got fatty liver disease and that causes uh, liver insulin resistance, which causes hyperinsulinemia, despite the fact that the glucose didn't raise the insulin. In fact, the liver dysfunction raised the insulin, but that's not measured in glycemic index. And it turns out that that's way worse for you because you're baseline insulin is with you 24 hours a day, whereas your insulin peaks from your meals are only with you about two hours a day. So that liver is where the action is. And that's where fructose causes all this damage because it gets turned into fat in the liver. Worse yet, fructose drives a specific reaction, which we're all very familiar with, it's the reaction that we uh, use to when we paint our ribs with barbecue sauce. It's called the Maillard reaction or the browning reaction. We like to caramelize, you know, certain foods because, well, it tastes better, you know, like caramel apples, you know, like candy apples and, and, um, and uh, like I said, ribs and, uh, you know, various other things that we candy. Um, that browning, is actually bad for you. That browning is destroying proteins in your uh, cells and it is causing your cells to function less well. So that's a process called glycation. It's the reason why diabetics check a, uh, a, a lab test called the hemoglobin A1C. It's the reason that uh, uh, diabetics um, have problems with their eyes and their nerves and their kidneys is because of this glycation problem of glucose binding to proteins and causing protein dysfunction. So glucose does that. Fructose does it seven times worse. So when you drink a glass of orange juice at breakfast, you are driving the aging reaction you are driving the reaction that causes wrinkles. You are driving the reaction that causes cataracts. You are driving the reaction that causes nerve problems. And the more you drink, the worse it is. So that fructose molecule doesn't get registered in the serum glucose. It doesn't get registered in glycemic index. It doesn't get registered even in hemoglobin A1C. It does its own damage. And it's not because it's calories, it's because it's a fructose molecule. And worse yet, that fructose molecule goes to the reward center of the brain and triggers it and says, this feels good, I want more. It's a hedonic substance. And hedonic substances in the extreme are addicting. So, Cocaine is addicting, heroin is addicting, nicotine is addicting, alcohol is addicting, not in everyone, but in a sizable proportion of the population. Well, guess what? Sugar is too. And for the same reason that alcohol is, not in everyone, but how many people do you know who say, oh, I have a horrible sweet tooth? That's sugar addiction. It's socially acceptable, so they don't mind telling you. I mean, they don't come up to you and say, oh, you know, gee, I have a horrible alcohol problem. You know, that's not socially acceptable. Right. But, but for sugar, you know, mother, you know, it's uh, Mother's Day, apple pie, 4th of July, you know, Valentine's Day, and it's everywhere. And not only that, but your grandma's a pusher. Right, right. 
And so when we think about, you know, you mentioned hemoglobin A1C, this is a proxy for measuring, you know, the average uh, blood glucose that an individual has had over the last three months. Do we have, because we can't see um, fructose that's being monitored by these CGMs or these finger prick uh, tests that you mentioned, do we have any uh, reasonable proxies that can look at fructose um, levels in the blood that would be similar to, or maybe, you know, indirectly, maybe transferases in the liver, or is there, is there something that we can look at that might reasonably indirectly potentially approximate our fructose consumption? So you're asking, is there a biomarker for fructose? Yes. That's what you're asking. And I totally get it. The answer is we have indirect ones, not direct ones. So for glucose, we have direct ones and that's good. Fructose, it generates a serum fructose level, but we don't measure that unless you have a research lab. And it's done in very few places around the world. Um, there is no hemoglobin A1C because that is glucose bound to the position one of hemoglobin. Um, there is a hemoglobin lysine 66 and 110, which is fructose specific. And if you're set up to measure that, then you can measure it, but that's not a standard clinical lab test that you can do. So these would be the ones that would be direct. There are indirect measures of fructose consumption, and there are two, the first, but neither of them measure fructose directly. Okay, the first one is the serum ALT, alanine aminotransferase. This is a liver function test. And it is sensitive, although not specific, for fatty liver. And fatty liver can be for a bunch of reasons, but fructose being the primary one. Now, the problem with ALT, I mean, everyone gets it. It's on your standard clinical lab panel. So everyone should know their ALT level, okay? And do not let your doctor tell you it's normal because your doctor doesn't know what normal is. So if you look at the panel, you look at the, the lab slip, you know, there's the, the, the analyte, then there's the reference range. And then in the third column, there's either an H or an L, you know, it's high, low. You know why that H and the L are there? That's 10 bucks. That's an interpretation, okay? The lab gets to charge for that H and L, which is the biggest joke on the planet. But nonetheless, that's what's there. So the doctor looks across and says, oh, your ALT is 33. That's normal because the upper limit of ALT is 40. So your ALT is normal. Mm -hmm. No, it's not. Not at all. Here's what happened. When I went to medical school in 1976, the upper limit for ALT was 25. Today it's 40. Same assay. They changed the name. It used to be called SGPT. Now it's called ALT. It doesn't matter. Same assay, but 50 years ago, it was 25 and today it's 40. What happened? Well, turns out everyone's got fatty liver disease. 45% of the United States population has fatty liver that you can detect on ultrasound. This is the biggest epidemic in the history of the world. It so outclasses COVID-19 and HIV and tuberculosis and syphilis and every other infectious disease combined that 45% of the entire US has fatty liver and 25% of the rest of the world has fatty liver. Boy, oh boy. Sorry about that. You know, I'm gonna, can you wait, excuse me for a minute? Of I'm course, gonna, yes, I'm of course. To this sure. Because it's it might keep doing this. Yeah, know. no worries. So sorry. Never expected that. No um, problem. It'll just be um, cut out. It's fine. So um, standard lab deviations. So uh, this is the biggest problem, biggest epidemic in the history of mankind. It so outclasses uh, 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 
COVID-19 and HIV and uh, syphilis and tuberculosis and influenza all put together because 45% of the entire US adult population has fatty liver and 25% of the rest of the world has fatty liver. Do you know how many billions and billions of people we are talking about that now have fat in their liver that they never did before? So this was a, the first diagnosis, the first uh, report of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. I mean, if you had fatty liver prior to 1980, it was alcohol. You were, yeah, you were an alcoholic. You were an alcoholic. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, this thing started showing up starting in 1980. And so the question is, what happened in 1980? Well, processed food is what happened in 1980. And we now know that that non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is primarily driven by sugar consumption. So that ALT, which had an upper limit of 25 in 1976, the entire curve has shifted to the right. And so now the cutoff for two standard deviations above the mean is at 40. The point is, if you've got an ALT of 33, you've got fatty liver and your doctor doesn't know it. So that's one biomarker. It's indirect, but it's sensitive, not specific. The second biomarker is a little harder. It's called uric acid. Now, uric acid is also on a standard chem panel, but uric acid measures two things, not one. It's famous for measuring purine consumption. So purines get converted to uric acid. Purines are, you know, what's in DNA, nucleic acids, adenine, thymine, et cetera. And when they get uh, metabolized, they go to uric acid. That's true. But it also is an indirect proxy for sugar consumption. And the reason is because when a fructose molecule enters the liver, it gets phosphorylated to fructose 1-phosphate. Therefore, ATP has to donate a phosphate, becomes ADP, and then that breaks down all the way to uric acid. So uric acid levels in the blood are an indirect proxy of total sugar consumption as well. And the uric acid level, if you look at the lab slip is also a problem because it will say anything up to seven is normal. If your uric acid is above 5.5, you've got a problem. Yep. Milligrams so, per deciliter, just for those that are listening. Yeah. That's the, so yeah. there are ways to be able to use the lab tests that we have available to us to get good assessments on your consumption and on the, on the health risks that they pose. You just have to be able to read them properly. And I guarantee you, your doctor doesn't know how because they were never taught, they were never trained. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Chapter nine is how to diagnose yourself. Show it to your doctor and let him or her learn how to use the lab tests to your advantage. Yeah, I, I love everything about this. And I think, you know, in the book, you really go into a lot of detail around some of the physiological impacts that fructose has. So you've already mentioned, um, you know, when we, when we consume glucose, for example, the, it has a, you know, our ghrelin, our satiety hormones are affected. We, we say, Hey, there's substrate coming in and right. our satiety levels will gradually increase until the point where, you know, leptin reaches a critical mass. And we say, okay, it's time to put the fork down. But when we contrast that with fructose, that doesn't happen. So when we consume fructose, like the, you know, the energy drinks and the, you know, the caramelized candy, you know, as you were saying, the caramelized candy apples and the sugars and things that ghrelin doesn't actually change. So what ends up happening, of course, is you're consuming this fructose. You're not feeling full. You're not getting that satiety signal from these appetite regulation centers in the brain. And you continue to consume calories and of course obesity and well a weight gain ensues and eventually over time that com like the compounded effect leads to obesity and other you know lifestyle diseases that happen with it that's right well the thing i want to uh, point i want to make is that there are actually three separate fat depots and they contribute differently and people are all worried about the obvious one the one you can see the subcutaneous or big butt fat, if you will, right, um, right. you know, because it's cosmetically undesirable. But right. from a metabolic standpoint, it's relatively inert. So 
having a big butt doesn't mean you're sick. There, so 80% of obese people are metabolically ill. They get type two diabetes, hypertension, lipid problems, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, fatty liver disease, polycystic ovarian disease, all of these chronic metabolic diseases that are all going up in the general population faster than we can deal with them. That's all true. 80% of obese people have these diseases, but that means that 20% do not. 20% of obese people are metabolically healthy. We actually have a name for them, MHO, metabolically healthy obese. They will live a completely normal life, die at a completely normal age, not cost the taxpayer a dime. They even have normal length telomeres, the edges of the chromosomes, the ends that ultimately when they unravel that causes cellular aging and ultimately that causes human aging and death. They have normal length telomeres, these 20%. So just because you wait more than you should doesn't mean you're sick from it. Conversely, and this is the important part, 40% of the normal weight population, BMI under 30, have the exact same diseases as do the obese. Normal weight people get hypertension, lipid problems, cardiovascular disease, cancer, dementia, diabetes, etc. Now they get it at a lower BMI, okay? They get it at a lower um, prevalence, 40% rather than 80%. But when you actually do the math, there are actually more thin sick people in America than there are fat sick people. And when you do, the math, on, yeah. and when you do the math on the two of them together, it's mm -hmm. more than half the US population. Mm -hmm. And if normal weight people get it too, how can it be about behavior? Right. This actually looks more like exposure. This looks more like cholera or influenza or tuberculosis or COVID-19 for that matter. Um, you know, some people in a, in, a, in, a, in a house will get it and some people won't. So the fact is that normal weight people have this problem too. And the reason they have it is not because of the subcutaneous fat. The reason they have it is either because of the visceral fat, the belly fat, and the belly fat only contributes about four to five kilos on the scale, you know, maybe eight to 12 pounds. So that doesn't necessarily put you into the obese range. Or worse yet, the liver fat. And the liver fat only has to rise by about 400 grams, less than a pound. And you definitely can't see that on the scale. Or feel so it. <laughs> yeah. If you have a fatty liver, you can be stick thin and still be just as sick as you know somebody who's got a BMI of 45. So it's not the fat you can see that matters. It's the fat you can't. And the problem is most people don't know that. And they don't know if they've got that problem. And there's a name for this. It's called TOFI, T-O-F-I. Thin on the outside, fat on the inside, real medical term, 1500 Medline citations coined by Dr. Jimmy Bell at University College London. So my question, not to you, but to your audience is, are you a TOFI? How would you know? How could you know? Does your doctor know? If your doctor knows, why isn't your doctor telling you? And if your doctor does know, what would they do about it? How would they fix it? These are the questions that people have to ask themselves and they can't ask it if they don't understand it. And that's the reason I wrote the book. Yeah. And I think, you know, when we think about, you know, NAFLD, when we think about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, as you were saying, it used to be that it was, you know, the alcoholics problem that leads to cirrhosis of the liver, et cetera. And now, you know, this human foie gras, <laughs> you very accurately <laughs> describe in the book, you know, some of the, you know, I think some of the common line thinking might be, well, this might be because of the consumption, overconsumption of fat or overconsumption of calories, or, you know, it's obesity. But I think that you, you present this ar argument that you can really, um, point to fructose as disproportionately driving this NAFLD versus some of these other factors because of the the tofies, right? Because of the people who are the skinny fats or the thin on the outside, fat on the inside. And you don't necessarily, you're not necessarily going to be obese if you're over consuming fructose, correct? 
That's right. It has nothing to do with whether you're obese or not. It has to do with whether or not your liver is obese or not. That's right. really what it comes down to. Um, we did a study that I think really sort of addresses this point that you just made. We took it, it, we did this at UCSF. We've published several papers on it and we actually have a few more to go. Um, what we did is we took 43 children from our obesity clinic at UCSF, all with metabolic syndrome, Latino and African-American, all low socioeconomic status, all high sugar consumers because they're all ultra processed food consumers. Okay, and we knew that they had metabolic syndrome because they had the stuff on the back of the neck and they had lab tests that documented it, all right? So what we did was we figured out what they were eating at home. We figured out their home diet through questionnaires and pictures. We studied them on their home diet. And then for the next nine days, we catered their meals. No added sugar. We took the added sugar out of their diet. We took their percent calories from added sugar down from 28% of calories down to 10% of calories. We gave them fruit. That's the only place they got sugar. All the other food was chosen to be no added sugar. We kept their fat content of their diet the same. We kept the protein content of the diet the same. And we kept the carbohydrate content of the diet the same. Now, if you take 20, if you go from 28% of calories of sugar down to 10% of calories of sugar, that's 350 to 400 calories a day gone. And the carbohydrate content of the diet goes down, right? Well, we didn't want that to happen. What we did was we said, we want to keep the carbohydrate content the same, and we want to keep the calorie content the same. So for every molecule of fructose we took out of their diet, we substituted a molecule of glucose. We gave them extra starch. We gave them more refined starch. So in the vernacular, we took the pastries out, we put the bagels in. We took the sweetened yogurt out, we put the baked potato chips in. We took the chicken teriyaki out, we put the turkey hot dogs in. Okay, so we didn't give them good food. We gave them crappy food. We gave them ultra processed food. We gave them kid food. We gave them food kids would eat. But it was no added sugar food. And we gave them a scale. And every day, they'd stand on the scale. we call them up on the phone, what'd you weigh? And if they were losing weight, eat more in order to keep their weight constant or you know, even potentially gain weight during the course of the nine days. So you were controlling but, for calories and you were just modifying even the macronutrients you were controlling for. You were just changing the type of carbohydrate. Right. Yeah. This is a glucose for fructose exchange. Yeah. That's what we did. Isocaloric, glucose for fructose exchange. That's how we refer to the study. And then we, at the end of 10 days, we re-studied all of them. Every aspect of their metabolic health improved. Everything. Their blood pressure went down by five points. Their blood glucose went down by five points. They had a lactate level at baseline. They didn't anymore. You're not supposed to have a lactate level at baseline. But if your mitochondria are not working, then you have a lactate level. They did. And when we took the sugar out of their diet, they didn't. Um, we, uh, their, their glucose area under the curve went down 8%. Their insulin area under the curve went down 25%, which is wow. enormous, enormous. Yeah, With no change in calories, no change in weight. And most importantly, their subcutaneous fat stayed exactly the same because they didn't lose any weight. Their visceral fat, belly fat, went down 7%. That's good. Their liver fat went down 22% in 10 days with no change in calories, no change in weight. And as their liver fat went down, their insulin secretion got better. In other words, we reversed the biochemical process that was leading to their insulin resistance and their diabetes. In other words, we reversed their metabolic syndrome. Right just by getting the sugar out of their diet and substituting starch. Mm -hmm. So can you imagine if we didn't substitute the starch, how much better they would have been? So this proved to us 
Number one, fructose is bad. Number two, a calorie is not a calorie. Number three, a sugar is not a sugar. And number four, it's the sugar that's in the processed foods that the food industry put there that is specifically causing the disease. And you can undo it even without changing your calories or your weight. Phenomenal. Let, let's talk, let's, let's go just one layer deeper in terms of this geeky science so that I have my listeners who can understand what is happening at the cellular level. And I think this will lead us really nicely into the eight, what you call the eight modern diseases that are not really diseases that we'll, that we'll touch on. And you, you've been talking about blood sugar uh, and we want to, we want to contrast that with insulin, right? So we've talked about this idea that, you know, diabetics and even, you know, in the biohacking kind of uh, human optimization camp, if you will, you know, CGM, uh, continuous glucose monitors uh, have been, have become of interest, but you talk about in the book that these two, pro so when we look at blood glucose, this can often be completely unrelated to blood insulin. And I wanted to, I wanted to have you walk through, you talk about these different checkpoints and again, sort of putting the nail in the coffin that a calorie is not a calorie. It's actually what your body does with the substrate that matters. So when we talk about, you know, check, we'll checkpoint ABC or alpha brava, Charlie, I think you call it. Uh, so we talk about the first Piece. So we have insulin and then it meets sort of the first checkpoint, which is uh, PI3 kinase, uh, you know, phosphatidyl and acetyl 3 kinase. So let's talk about how insulin right. and PI3, how they collaborate to flood the cell with glucose. What happens there? So in order, so I'm glad you brought it up. So let, let, let's, let's step back one step first. You mentioned the eight modern diseases that aren't diseases, because yes. it's important to understand that before we get into the checkpoints. Great. Um, people think diabetes is the disease. It's not. It's the symptom of the disease. People think heart disease is the disease. It's not. It's the symptom of the disease. People think high LDL is the problem. No, it's not. It's a symptom of the problem. High blood pressure, symptom of the problem. Well, what is the problem? And by the way, we only have medicines to treat the symptoms. We don't have medicines to treat the disease. And the reason is because the disease is actually inside the cell, unavailable, and we can't get there. These true pathologies, what's going on inside the cells are not druggable, but they are foodable. We can fix it with food. So here they are. I'm going to list the eight, and we can talk about each and every one of them or not, you know, depending on time. One, glycation, we mentioned this Maillard reaction, the browning. Two, oxidative stress. Every time this reaction occurs, you release a little hydrogen peroxide, which can do damage, which has to be quenched by an antioxidant. What if you don't have enough antioxidants because you're eating ultra processed food? Number three, mitochondrial dysfunction, where your mitochondria don't work. And we showed that because the lactate went away, right? when we actually got the mitochondria to work right by taking away the su substrate that was the poison, the sugar. Number four, insulin resistance, which we've mentioned now a couple of times. If your insulin is not working at your liver, then your pancreas has to make more. That raises levels all over the body and drives chronic disease elsewhere. Number five, membrane instability. Imagine your cells are balloons, okay? You can put, you know, try to push your finger into a balloon and it'll come straight back. That's called membrane fluidity, the flexibility of that. But what if you use a pin instead? Up, oh, popped. Okay, the point is that the more that your um, uh, uh, balloon is stretched, the easier it is to pop. And there are certain fatty acids that go into the membranes that give your membranes resiliency. And the main one being omega-3s, and we're not eating enough of those. Number six, inflammation. And the inflammation can occur in many places in the body, but the biggest source of the inflammation is in your gut, having to do with leaky gut, having to do with problems with your gut not functioning as the barrier that it should. And it's partly because of your microbiome, and it's partly because of your food. Number seven, methylation. So there's a particular um, uh, 
a, a, a metabolite called homocysteine that has to be cleared or it causes disease. And one of the things that helps you do that is folate. And the problem is there's an enzyme that you need in order to do that called methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. And a lot of people have mutations in it. And if you don't, it, then you have to take a whole lot more folic acid to make the thing work. Um, so methylation is a problem and it causes problems with the DNA. And finally, number eight, sort of my personal favorite called autophagy. So autophagy is garbage night for the cell. Okay, your cell has to clear crap that it made over the course of the day. So defective membranes, mitochondria that are dysfunctional, uh, various uh, uh, protein aggregates that have uh, accumulated. Okay, and it, the more these accumulate, the less well your cell works and finally your cell will die. Okay, you gotta get rid of them. And there's a process in the cell for getting rid of them. By the way, in the brain, it happens when you sleep. And it's the reason you need to sleep. Sleep is garbage night for the brain to get rid of all the crap that developed over the previous 16 hours. You got to sleep. And if you don't sleep, guess what? You get dementia. And the nut paper just came out this morning about that. So sleep is absolutely essential. And it gives your body a chance to basically get rid of the junk that got made over the course of the last 24 hours. Well, Food affects every single one of these eight mechanisms. And we don't have medicines for any one of those eight that work. So that's why food is so important. That's why I wrote the book. Okay, now to these checkpoints. Each cell in your body, no matter where it is, and no matter what it is, at one time in its life, it had to grow. And at another time in its life, it had to burn. How does a cell know whether it should be growing or burning? Both are appropriate, but only at certain times. What happens if a cell should be burning, but it's not, it's growing? What happens if a cell should be growing, but it's not, it's burning? What happens? The answer is you get sick. Turns out there are three enzymes in each cell in your body that dictate growing or burning and living or dying. And those three enzymes, have, they have names. They're all kinases. They're all enzymes. The first one is called PI3 kinase, phosphatidyl and acetyl 3 kinase. It's the doorway for glucose to enter the cell. It works with insulin, and insulin is necessary, but PI3 kinase is also necessary. It's the enzyme that's revved up in cancer. It's the, cell, it's the enzyme that lets all the glucose in in cancer. You've heard that cancer cells are sugar hogs, and they are. And the reason is because they are growing and they need energy and they need it big time. And PI3 kinase is the way that the cell is able to transfer that energy from the outside to the inside. So that's the first one. The second enzyme is called AMP kinase, adenosine monophosphate kinase. That is the enzyme that ultimately determines whether your mitochondria are burning or, turn, or turning off so that you can use the carbon backbones of the glucose for other things like, for instance, DNA or lipids or amino acids for growth. So cancer cells don't have mitochondria. Cancer cells don't need mitochondria. They get their ATP from fermentation from glycolysis, from you know, the same way yeast do it, the same way we do it in, with wine, all right? They do not need oxygen. Cancer cells do not need oxygen. And Otto Warburg in 1931 won the Nobel Prize for figuring out that cancer cells don't need oxygen. They need lots of glucose. And the reason is because the glycolysis generates enough ATP to power the cell, and then the cell can use the backbones of the glucose for structural phenomena. It's like having f uh, uh, um, a piece of furniture in your, in your house, okay? You can use that piece of furniture, that wooden piece of furniture for two things. You can sit on it, or you can throw it in the fire and burn it, but you can't do both at the same time, okay? So you can either burn it or you can grow it, but you can't do both. Um, 
the, so AMP kinase determines whether you're burning it, whether that fireplace is going and whether you're throwing it into the, into the furnace or not. And then the third enzyme is called mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin. And this is the uh, enzyme that ultimately determines whether a cell lives or dies. So if it's growing and it's living, then you get growth, you know, organismal growth. This is what happens in the placenta, you know, in, in, in the fetus. And that's what happens in cancer. You've got P3 kinase going great guns, you've got AMP kinase turned off, and you've got mTOR turned on. That's growth. On the other side, you have burning, where P3 kinase is turned off, AMP kinase is turned on, and mTOR is turned off, and that's burning. And so you can grow, you can burn. But what happens if those three enzymes are not in order? Turns out every time that one of those enzymes is dyssynchronous with the others, that's chronic disease. Different kinds of chronic disease, but chronic disease. And what makes those enzymes dyssynchronous? Our food. So when you eat the right food, your enzymes work together and you'll either grow or burn depending. And when you're eating the wrong food, you might be turning off your AMP kinase when you should be turning it on. You might be turning on your PI3 kinase when you should be turning it off. And what will happen is you will flood your cell. Your cell won't know what to do with the excess. It will turn it into fat. And now you've got chronic disease. Yeah. And this is, this is why, you know, kind of coming back to that point where a calorie is not just a calorie. It has nothing to, you know, in some ways it's, it's nothing to do. It has everything to do with what happens to the substrate, what ha like the cellular metabolism. And, and this brings us to those subcellular pathologies that you just um, so eloquently uh, described. Right. And yeah. The, the problem is that the calorie myth persists to this day. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are medical professionals, you know, married to it. And, you know, they, that's how they make their living. Um, some of them are doctors. A lot of them are dietitians. Few even dentists. But the bottom line is my job in this book is to f drive the final silver stake through the heart of the calorie. Mm -hmm. The calorie must die. It, when the calorie dies, then we can come out from under and we can actually start addressing the real problem, which is metabolic health, the real driver, which is insulin. And then we can actually change the food so that we can actually get healthy, but not until. Well, let's talk a little bit about the intersection of your work and your career as a pediatric endocrinologist and some of the patterns that you observed in children. You said in the book, something like, you know, pediatricians are witness to, you know, all the failed social policies that, uh, that happen in government and, and sort of the, the downstream effects of that. I wish and I had said that. Um, my, my colleague uh, at Stanford, Paul Wise said that, but I totally agree with that. Okay, so when we when we think about and we can we can marry this with a conversation around big food because I think that what we what I have seen and you you may have similar or uh, you know more uh, color to give here is that we're starting to see you know the NAFLD and some of these subcellular pathologies happening earlier and earlier and earlier like we used yeah, to think sure. of like NAFLD as like this fifty year old you know alcoholic and now it's you know, we see it in 12 year olds and we see it in eight year olds. Is that, is that um, a lot alongside so, with what you've noticed? Absolutely. So the, the diseases, diseases are occurring earlier and earlier. So here's what we know. Type two diabetes used to be rare. Type two diabetes was 2.5% of the population and 5% of the population over 65 back in 1976 when I entered medical school. Today, it is 9.4% of the population. So it has basically quadrupled mm -hmm. in the span of 45 years, quadrupled. And everyone has, knows somebody who's diabetic today. And that's why every diabetes drug is advertised on TV directly to the patient. Okay. I mean, who'd, have, who'd ever thought that? But, you know, this was a rare disease. Well, guess what? Now, one third of all diabetes diagnoses in children is type two. 
a disease we never saw in children. I actually went into pediatrics to avoid chronic disease. And now that's all I do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Number two disease, fatty liver disease. So we talked about 45% of adults now have fatty liver worldwide you know, in the America and 25% worldwide. Children have fatty liver disease. Autopsy specimens of, people, of kids who died for other causes demonstrate a 15% prevalence and a 38% prevalence in obese kids. Fatty liver. Now, like we said, prior to 1980, if you had fatty liver, it was because you drank alcohol. Well, kids don't drink alcohol. So how did they get fatty liver? And the answer is they're drinking sugar. And sugar and alcohol are metabolized the same way. Fructose and alcohol are virtually metabolized identically. The big difference between the two is that for alcohol, the yeast does the first step, the glycolysis, the fermentation. For Sugar, we do our own first step. But after that, the mitochondria become overwhelmed. And the mitochondria don't care where the substrate came from. It doesn't care, care if it came from fructose or it came from alcohol. Ultimately, all it knows is it can't handle the load. And it has no choice but to take that extra and turn it into fat. So, it can, so the liver can try to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, it's not very successful. And then it precipitates in the liver now you've got fatty liver disease. And that's how kids get the diseases of alcohol, type 2 diabetes and fatty liver disease, without alcohol. And all you have to do is look what we're serving them for breakfast. So I wrote an editorial back in The Guardian back in 2017. If, if, uh, uh, if alcohol is the uh, disease of the child, uh, sorry, the disease of alcohol and now the disease of the child. How do we let uh, breakfast cereal dominate the breakfast table? Right, right. So, you know, if you look at the national school breakfast program, it's a bowl of Fruit Loops and a glass of orange juice. That's 41 grams of sugar. We're not supposed to be giving children more than three teaspoons of sugar. That's 12 grams. So we are giving them 41 when their maximum for the day is 12. We are giving them triple to quadruple their total daily allotment and it's just breakfast. So what do you think is gonna happen? Yeah. And it's, it's so easy to have these modern conveniences, right? Like I know that there's parents that are listening to this and like, oh, but the cereal takes two minutes, the sugared oatmeal, I just put hot water and it's there. And that's their plan. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why they do it. Yeah. That's exactly why they do it. That's how the food industry infiltrated the entire U.S. school system, basically saying, give us you know, the, uh, the uh, uh, keys to your kid and will provide them with, quote, healthy, unquote, meals. And you can take your kitchens and your lunch ladies, you can take your kitchens and turn them into, you know, more classrooms, you know, for infrastructure. And you can take your lunch ladies and fire them because, you know, we don't need food prep in the schools and you can save money. And you know, once you do that, and once you, you know, take those kitchens and use it for infrastructure, they're not going to come back. You know, it's not like you're going to remake the kitchen. And that was their plan all along. And, you know, if you don't know how to cook, you're hostage to the food industry for the rest of your life. And schools today don't know how to cook. Well, we started a nonprofit here in the in Bay Area called Eat Real. And I want all of your, uh, listeners to you know go online and look at eatreal.org our job is to get real food back into schools to fix this problem and we have a very specific food procurement and preparation model that can be you know adapted and you know uh, du reduplicated in any school district in the country and we are doing that with 213 school districts right now 
That's incredible. And I'll make sure that that's in our show notes as well for uh, my listeners that are, uh, that want to find out more information about that. And that's like, be- that's like the beginning of, you know, creating the patient, right? It's like you give them the 41 grams uh, of sugar in the morning. And of course they're going to exceed that through the, you know, the uh, next meals through the day. And you, one of the things you talked about, you know, kind of getting into big food and processed food is this idea of, it's not necessarily what the food is, but what has been done to the food that we don't see. And That's I wondered right. if you can give a couple examples of maybe some of the, what you call fraudulent food practices or some of the things that we see in big food that parents might be like, God, I never, you know, for one of the things that I was, I, uh, um, I thought was really interesting was the Italian olive oil. It was in the, you know, dilution uh, piece. You said most Italian olive oil is neither uh, like Italian, neither Italian nor olive oil. Nor olive oil. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about some examples of food well, fraud that we may be seeing in, in grocery stores? And so um, there's, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, food fraud. Um, there's honey is the biggest one. Honey is huge. Basically, if you're buying honey in a grocery store, it's not honey. It's corn syrup with, uh, you know, few uh, uh, colorings added to it, but it doesn't even resemble anything close to honey. There's actually a new certified honey program that's going on. The problem is that those honeys, those cheap, you know, crappy, non, non-nutritive non honeys have basically taken over the entire market. And so real honey producers can't even sell their honey because they have nobody to sell it to because it's too expensive. So. It's a big issue, uh, uh, as an example. The same is true for scotches and wines and everything, you know, for on the high end too. But it's it's a major problem in um, in uh, in terms of food fraud uh, around around the world, not just in America. But it's even more importantly, as as you said, it's what's been done to the food. So let me give you an example of what's been done to the food that matters. Okay, let's take meat. Okay. Do you eat meat? I do. Okay, good. I mean, you know, some people now don't, uh, and there are reasons and, you know, sometimes it's religious and sometimes it's, you know, environmental and sometimes it's, you know, cost and, and, but a lot of it has to do with metabolism. People think red meat will kill you. You know, you've been told by so many different sources that, you know, red meat is just going to kill you. Mm-hmm. And it's a possible carcinogen. That's what we hear. Yeah, you, hear that three, too. Yeah. you hear that too. Yeah. Yeah. I am here to tell you that that is not automatically the case. Let me give you an example. In the book, I show a picture of a, uh, of a, a window. I took a, a Rome restaurant window when I was in Rome in 2016. And it, on the top was Italian beef. And in the middle was Argentinian beef. And at the bottom was US grade A, prime choice corn fed beef. And there was a very clear difference between the US beef and the other two because the US beef was marbled. Now we value that marbling. We prize our meat on the basis of that marbling because that marbling is where the taste is and that marbling is where you know it makes it you know you can cut it with a butter knife you know you go to the uh, you go to the steak restaurant and you know you can practically you know it, it, it practically drips off the side of the plate right and it's enormous to boot right it's like this you know mm-hmm. uh, you know what i'm talking about so here's the question is meat supposed to have marbling I would venture, no. I mean, that sounds like sarcopenic obesity to me <laughs> in, in the cow. <laughs> kind of, sort of, yeah. Yeah. Um, that marbling that we prize, that's intramyocellular lipid. That's lipid inside the muscle. That animal has metabolic syndrome. Right. That animal has the same disease we have, right? That animal goes from birth to slaughter in six months. A normal cow from Argentina or Italy goes from birth to slaughter in 18 months. But hey, birth to slaughter in six months, that's cash flow, right? Yeah, three times as fast. Three times as fast. And they do it by eating corn, corn corn-fed beef. What do cattle normally eat? They eat 
grass, right? And that's why they have four stomachs. Okay, that's why they're ruminants. But when you eat uh, corn, you don't need four stomachs. Right? The bottom line is the branch chain amino acids, the isoleucine, the, uh, the leucine and the valine in the, in the corn, which by the way, is not just fed to the beef, it's fed to the chicken and the fish too. Those branch chain amino acids, they flood our liver. Our liver cannot use all of them to build muscle unless you're a bodybuilder. So what does the body do? What does the liver do with all those excess branch chain amino acids? It has to take the amino group off, has to deamidate that amino acid. So that branch chain amino acid becomes a branch chain organic acid, such as oxaloacetate, enters the Krebs cycle. The Krebs cycle becomes overwhelmed in the same way sugar overwhelmed it, and it throws off as fat. And so that's the fat that those animals are producing that ends up in ending up in the muscle that leads to the marbling. That animal has metabolic syndrome, same as us. We just kill it before it gets sick. So how do you do that? Well, you give the animal corn and you don't just give the animal corn on the farm, you give the animal the corn on the CAFO, the concentrated animal feeding operation which is in Kansas, but the corn's in Iowa. So the corn gets grown in Iowa and gets put on a railroad car and gets taken to the CAFO in Kansas where the animal eats the corn and then becomes massively obese and gets metabolic syndrome and then we kill it. Okay, so what's wrong with this picture? How about everything? I was gonna say everything is wrong with everything. this picture, yes. So the, the Farm in Iowa used to be a family farm and there would be the cows and there would be the corn and the cows would eat the corn and then the, and they also ate the alfalfa and the clover and everything else that was on the farm and they would poop. Okay. And the poop had all this nitrogen in it and the nitrogen would then fix inside the ground and the, that would, the nitrates would serve as the fertilizer for the corn so that the corn could grow. And this was an ecosystem. So the corn fed the cows, the cows fed the corn, and all was right with the world. Carbon sink as well, like carbon you know, sink. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it was and it was solid, so it was fixed mm -hmm. in the ground. Then we took the cows and we moved them to Kansas because we were told back in 1971 by Richard Nixon's agriculture secretary, Earl Rusty Butts. His name was that the U.S. agriculture uh, uh, enterprise had to get lean and mean, and he said three things: row to row, furrow to furrow, get bigger, get out. That was Butts's message to Nebraska and Kansas and Missouri and you know every, you know the entire Midwest. So that led to the new monoculture paradigm. Put the cattle in Kansas on the CAFO and leave the uh, 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 farm to the corn in Iowa. Well, when you do that, you don't have any fertilizer for the corn. So what do you have to do? You have to spray the corn with nitrogen fertilizer. That nitrogen fertilizer leads to runoff, damages the water tables, ends up in the Missouri River, then the Mississippi River. And this is the reason why we have the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico where you can't fish and where algae blooms are now raising temperatures around the world because of nitrogen fertilizer. And the reason you have to spray the nitrogen fertilizer is because there's no cows. So you are destroying, you're, you know, I mean, you're, you're growing the corn, but you're destroying the environment. Now, you move the uh, cows to Kansas. The cows eat the corn in, on the CAFO. Turns out the corn isn't enough. They, that's actually malnutrition. It makes them obese, but it doesn't actually give them the nutrition to be able to stave off all of the infectious diseases that occur on the CAFO with all of these cattle so cramped together, eating, their, each, eating each other's shit. 
excuse my French. Mm -hmm. So then we have to then be able to keep them from dying. We have to give them antibiotics. And so what happened? The antibiotics kept them from dying so that they could make it to slaughter. Okay, that's true. But the antibiotics permeate the meat. We eat the antibiotics when we eat the meat. We change our own intestinal microbiome. And so now we have both obesity and we also have irritable bowel syndrome and other uh, inflammatory bowel disease and possibly food allergy and even other autoimmune diseases that occur because of the changes in the microbiome and what we call leaky gut. Because of the antibiotics, we fed the cows in order to keep them alive. In addition, we ain't done yet. <clears throat> the good bacteria in the cow's intestine are very susceptible to those antibiotics. The bad bacteria are not. They tend to proliferate. And a lot of them are <clears throat> what are known as methanogens. They make methane. So everyone complains that the cows are bad because they make methane and that we got to get rid of the cows in order to solve climate change because there's too much methane. Well, so happens that if you look at the amount of methane that cows produced back in 1968, it was one quarter of the amount of methane they produce today. And we had more heads of cattle back then Whoa. than we do now. Mm. And the reason is because the methanogens have taken over. And the only reason the methanogens took over is because we had to give them antibiotics. And the only reason we had to give them antibiotics is because we moved them onto the CAFO. And the only reason we moved them on the CAFO was cash flow. So we are screwing ourselves a thousand times over, both in terms of the food and in terms of our health and in terms of our climate for our current ultra-processed food processing paradigm. This is what the book is about. And there are big forces. There are big, you know, and we, you know, we don't have to get into uh, veganism and sort of sometimes I've had Rob Wolf on the podcast and he talks about this sort of uh, we'll call it vegan fantasy where, you know, we get rid of all the meat and we solve the problem, but as oh. you're, it's much more complex than that. And when right. we, when we think about regenerative agricultural practices, as you were talking about where the cows are pooping and peeing all over the place and they're, you know, the soil is, is soil. It's not dirt, you That's know, it's true. alive and it has the ability to absorb some of these carbon dioxide, um, uh, you know, off gassing, that's how, that's how we improve climate change. It's, it's that's the right. animals are, are uh, an essential part of that. That's right. Soil's alive and dirt is dead. Yeah. Okay. Now you can grow uh, crops in dirt, but only if you give them a lot of fertilizer. Right. And the problem is that that leads to the runoff that leads to the um, climate problems. So, you know, this is not a sustainable method for agriculture. Um, ultimately, what we used to do worked. What we do today doesn't. The only difference is now the food's cheaper and worse quality. So is that okay? Does that make sense? And the, you know, some people are worried about food insecurity and they say, you know, we've got to have enough food. You know, the fact of the matter is we have an obesity disaster, particularly amongst the people who are most food insecure. And the reason is not because they don't get enough food. They don't get enough good food. And Tom Vilsack, our new, agri new old agriculture secretary in his confirmation hearing on March 4th, famously said, we have to pivot from food security to nutritional security. Yes. Now, to be honest with you, that is a tacit admission that our food sucks. Because mm -hmm. why would we need to do that if it didn't? Right. right. And the fact of the matter is he now gets that this is the real problem in uh, today, but we cannot fix it with our processed food culture. The only way to do this is to rethink the food we eat at, you know, at the most basic level. And the science has to drive the policy. And we have the science and we have the, you know, the uh, concepts for the policy. The problem is we also have the politics and that's the current uh, uh, stumbling block. And so we have to elevate this problem 
in you know in, in Congress, you know, in the Biden administration to basically take this on. We certainly got no traction from the previous administration. We had a president who was a fast food junkie, okay, who actually deep sixed the added sugar on the uh, on the nutrition facts label. But I would argue, and I argue in the book, that it's not what's on the label that matters. It's what's not on the label. Because what's, what's on the label is what's in the food. Um, what I argue is it's actually what's been done to the food that matters. Mm -hmm. All food is inherently good. It's what we do to the food that's not. And the two things that are the most famous that we do to the food that's not is we add sugar for palatability, we subtract fiber for shelf life. Now, there are many other things like the branched chain amino acids and the um, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons from cooking and, and a whole bunch of other things that we do. And they're all listed in the book and all the additives and all the um, uh, 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 food additions, food subtractions, you know, food adulterations of various sorts. But if we could just agree on sugar and fiber, we would solve 80% of our food problems. In the, I'm um, just looking at the time, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, you talked about politics and I wanted to make sure that we touched on the, some of the other dark forces that are keeping these subcellular pathologies alive and well today. And that is through, um, you know, the, we'll call it the, you know, deep sixing from, uh, from big pharma. And you, you talk about, you know, your own education, your own experience as a medical doctor going through medical school and, I was so happy to read this. I was telling this to you in the pre-chat because, you know, so often we defer to the medical doctor as the cultural authority for all things health, everything from nutrition and movement and rehab and lifestyle all the way through to drugs and surgery and, you know, any, any type of intervention. And you talk about in the book that the average medical school, I mean, we'll talk about how, you know, big pharma tends to fund the curriculum, but the, in the curriculum in and of itself, you know, 19.6, I think was the uh, 19 points, like just shy of 20 hours of nutritional uh, education in a four year medical degree, which is not even a week. It's not a week of nutrition. So you, you make this case in the book that modern medicine is not the solution to the problem, that it is the problem. Can you expand a little bit on the influences that big pharma has on educating? Because I, I believe that all doctors, irrespective of the letters behind your name, you get into the game because you want to make this place a better a better world. You want to help people. And I think a lot of, I've have a lot of friends who are medical doctors who become disenfranchised and really disappointed in the way things are and the things that they thought they could influence. They know they can't because of, you know, regulation and standards of care and, you know, et cetera. Can you, can you explain a little bit about big pharma's influence on, um, on our medical doctors? Well, it starts at the beginning. You're absolutely right. It starts at the beginning. <clears throat> it starts with the Flexner report. Right. So the Flexner Report came out in 1910. It's written by Abraham Flexner, who was an educator. His brother was Simon Flexner, who was the president of the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, which became the Rockefeller University where I worked, actually. Um, Flexner was charged by John D. Rockefeller himself to overturn the current med the medical school paradigm of the time to make it more scientifically based. And he did that. And there are a lot of good things about the Flexner Report in terms of you know, demanding evidence base for most of the things, because up to that point, there was a lot of folk remedy and you know, um, you know, a lot of you know, uh, just- Bloodletting and yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. leachings, right? You know, uh, phrenology, you know, like, mm -hmm. like this thing here. Where is it? I gotta get it. Ah. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> There it is, right there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, nice. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, the uh, Flexner did that, but um, he he was charged very specifically, and so was um, Simon Flexner very specifically with um, helping Rockefeller into a new uh, industry. So obviously, you know, the oil industry, you know, Standard Oil, but. Standard Oil created a huge amount of a byproduct called coal tar. And he didn't know what to do with all that coal tar, but it was found 
back in the um, late 1800s, the coal tar was good for various problems, medical problems, such as eczema and psoriasis and several other things when you paint it on, actually it ends up causing cancer, but he didn't know that at the time. Um, but actually coal tar is still used as a base for many, many other products. And he wanted basic to, to push coal tar. And so Rockefeller Institute set up in 1901 to investigate the uses, medicinal uses of coal tar in order to grow John D. Rockefeller's second business. That's what happened. Well, in the process, nutrition was completely left out. Now, the Flexner Report came out in 1910. The first vitamin, thiamine, was isolated and discovered and published on in 1912. There is nothing in the Flexner Report about nutrition, nothing. Well, now we know that there are vitamins. And then after thiamine came, you know, niacin, and then came, you know, uh, you know, the whole slew of riboflavin, et cetera. And, and, you know, I mean, we were in the grand uh, 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 stage of, you know, vitamin uh, uh, understanding and nutritional deficiencies. Did it change medical school education or practice? No. Did it change the Flexner Report? Was there an addendum? No. The fact of the matter is, Big Pharma grew up from that Flexner report and they started funding medical education. And the last thing in the world they wanted you to know was that you could actually fix any diseases with food. And so doctors don't learn nutrition. And today, 28% of medical schools have a nutrition curriculum. What about the rest of them? And as you said, even the ones that do only get about 19.6 hours. So the bottom line is doctors don't know a damn thing about nutrition. The only reason I did was because I majored in nutritional biochemistry in college. So perhaps I was set up for this, you know, ready for this. In fact, when I went in and talked about, you know, nutritional biochemistry to my professors in medical school, I was basically shut down. Mm -hmm. I said, no, no, we don't do that. You know, it's all about calories. And so I figured, you know, these are the guys, you know, who are practicing medicine, I guess, you know, I better listen to them. And so for the first 20 years of my career, I practiced like they did, and I wasn't making anybody better. And, you know, then I started doing research. And uh, on, this, on this subject, I had been doing the research on sex differentiation of the brain up to that point. But then I started doing uh, 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 obesity research. And because leptin had been discovered, so I was trying to figure out what the story with leptin was. And you know what? The, the data didn't match the party line. In fact, the data matched what I had learned back in college. And so it became very clear to me that there was something going on to suppress this information. And this is like consensus when, medicine, like what we would call consensus. You know, it's like the majority of people are going to agree on it and then we're not really going to discuss it. There's no scientific discourse around different ideas or ideologies. That's right. And what I've come to realize is that big pharma has more than a vested stake in the outcome. And so they want to keep the status quo. And so in the book, I very specifically say, doctors need to unlearn nutrition. Dietitians lost their mind. <laughs> if they still believe in calories. Yeah. Dentists lost their way because of fluoride. And the last is because Big Pharma was their teacher. Right. So, and what Big Pharma wants, Big Pharma gets, you know, like they have for every, I think you, there's a stat you said in the book, every dollar that they spend on R&D, there's like 19 or 20 bucks spent on promotion of said product. Right. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. So this is what's wrong. And the question is, can we fix it? Yeah. And the answer is we can fix it but we have to want to fix it. But when you realize that there's really no choice, that what we've got today is unsustainable. I mean, we've got you know, $1.9 trillion a year going down a rat hole in healthcare for things that don't make anybody any better. And you know, that social security and Medicare will both be broke by the year 2029. We really have no choice. We have to, you cannot fix healthcare until you fix health. You cannot fix health until you fix diet. And you cannot fix diet until you know what the hell is wrong. And we know what the hell is wrong. 
but we have to want to fix it. You are, my friend, a woke doctor. <laughs> Try it. <laughs> You're, this book, I cannot recommend this book enough. I was telling you in the pre-chat, I'll tell my listeners like 70 pages of notes I took on this bad boy and tell people where they can find the book, uh, where they can find more of your work. This is not your first uh, rodeo with writing books. You have previous books. Tell people where they can find you, your work, and where they can purchase Metabolical. Thank you. So, um, so I have a website that robertlustig.com where uh, you know you can find my entire CV, you know, linked, etc. Metabolical.com is the website for the book. Uh, I want to mention that the book has 1,054 references to the primary literature on purpose. Now, if we put those 1,054 references between the covers, that would have been an extra 70 pages. And that would have been, I don't know how many thousands of trees, and it would have been five extra bucks per copy. So we made a conscious decision, Harper Collins and I, that we would put the uh, bibliography online. So you go to metabolical.com, you pick the chapter you're in, you look at the page number and the links for all of 1,054 references are right there. And all you have to do is click and it will take you right to the primary source information so that you can know that I ain't making this crap up. Amazing. So we will have those uh, robertlustig.com, metabolical.com. And uh, you wrote Fat Chance, I believe, was uh, your previous book back in so, the 2012. So Fat Chance in yeah. 2013 was about diet and physical health. Mm -hmm. The Hacking of the American Mind in 2017 was about diet and behavioral health. Mm. So addiction and depression. And now Metabolical tries to combine both the physical and mental health um, issues uh, by explaining that it's not what you eat, it's what you do with what you eat, except that's not even right. It's really what they did with what you eat. And that is the reason I wrote the book. Fat Chance argued it's what you do with what you eat, it's the metabolism that matters. And this book argues that it, the reason our metabolism has gone so awry is because of what they did to you. Mm -hmm. You need to know it in order to protect yourself and in order to fix it. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your time today and your brilliance. And it really does read like a, uh, like a kiss and tell, as you were saying. Uh, <laughs> well, so, about diabetes. So it's really a piss and tell. It's a piss and tell. <laughs> yeah. I love it. And I, I think this book is uh, just extraordinary and I I'm wishing you the best of luck with it. And we will shout this far and wide and this will come out the week that your book also uh, debuts. So thank you for your time today and, oh, uh, you. and your work. I, I cannot thank, tell you. Yeah. Thank, thank you for, you know, you know, sh shall we say devouring it? I have devoured it. Yes. It's, yeah. uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty thick and chewy. <laughs> <laughs> but not marbled. No. no. Not no. Marbled. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank uh, you so much. <laughs> pleasure. Nice to meet you. And you. Pleasure. Dr. Stephen Gundry is the video that's coming up next for you. Just click right here. We're talking about the microbiome, energy, postbiotics, mitochondria, and how to get your energy back. Continuous ketosis, 24 hours, seven days a week, 365 days a year is really dumb.